Okay, I should be getting close to a couple more squirts of R410. Still got low, pretty low sub cooling. Pumping it down. Whoops, zero. Hands ready on this. <laughs> Just, uh, that's minus <laughs> 16 inches there. So just use the uh, pinch off tools to capture the refrigerant. So I can cut out this coil and put a larger one on there. So this of course is another wham, bam, thank you bam, just experimenting and whatnot, and just stuff I already have, you know, laying around. So I'm just adding section of condenser coil to my hybrid water heater you see in here and i want to show you this fitting i just made real quick this is just out of straight quarter inch tubing and i didn't video it but you know i like to make a little dimple usually with a sharpie screw and then i'll take like one you know this little quarter inch spin swage and it's kind of cool how it nurdles it out it actually makes something like like a little bit of this fitting you know how the factory does it is punch a hole and nurdle it. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it, it like kind of lifts the copper out and gives you a little bit of mass, you know, to put, to, to put another T fitting into. You. So I put this Schrader, so I'm going to want this right here in the liquid line. So I got that in there and I put a lot of extra silk floss for strength to make it kind of rock hard right there so it won't bust. Should be good, but check this out. You always get worried that you're going to push this tube too far into the T and restrict the flow, but. Nope, that's wide open through there. That's awesome. So uh, hopefully this all works when it's said and done. Got it on evacuation for this pinched off section right there. But initially, you know, I used to just uh, use the heat exchanger. You can't see it. It's from a water source heat pump. It's a tube and tube heat exchanger over here. It's all encapsulated in foam. And I reject the hot gas directly into that to heat the water heater and initially this was made to heat water this is the, was the evaporator it still is for winter mode this was the evaporator and that just rejected heat into the heat exchanger with the circulation pump and heated the water and you only heated the water for like 130 or so and everything's great but then i took my high wall and put all these service valves up here i just have this protection but um and, and, and so what I have is I shut off the outdoor coil for the summer and then have it use the one inside that room to cool that mechanical room during the summer. But just to keep that room at like 88 or so, and the water heater, people weren't using water during the day, and that's when this thing cools. It's making the water get really hot like yesterday. You know, I come home in the afternoon and the, the, the tank is up to 144 degrees because... Nobody was using hot water, but yet the uh, thing keeps cooling that room just to keep it down to 88 or 86, actually, I think I had it set for. I should have turned it up. But so earlier this summer, when summer started and I redid this like that, I kind of added a little bit of outside coil with this little section I cut off of another coil. It's a little, little like quarter inch tubes. Actually, a little bigger than quarter inch. So might be eight millimeter, five sixteenths. And it, was, it wasn't quite enough. It's because by the time that water overheats and then it was going through that little bit of coil here, which is too much. You know, it is a little 10,000 BTU, I think, or so. Compressor. It just, it just, it's, it never tripped on high head pressure, but it just loses a little bit in cooling performance and then just make it run longer and heat the water even more. So I just decided I'm going to try to put a bigger, like a lot bigger. Now these are really small tubes. These are actually smaller. That this is a condenser coil out of like a small little unit. Actually, actually this compressor might have came out of it. So this would have been the outdoor coil. I just have it in series with the what's now the evaporator coil. <laughs> so uh, let's see what happens with that. And I'm just waiting for it to evacuate. So I can uh, take off the pinch off tool and start it back up. Probably have to add a little bit of refrigerant, of course. Yeah, so that's what I'm doing. This is just Frankenstein stuff. I mean, this is nothing you'd ever do for a customer. You would never even contemplate it because you're going to spend time on it. It's just, you know, trial and error. 
and I did hook up like some a mister to kind of mist a little bit of water on that little coil I had but it was and you can see like this green stuff that's just from that over the last month or so it's, I mean, it's not ruined or anything but it is it did tarnish grow the outs, outer layer of my copper make it look ugly but it was dripping you know it wasn't all evaporating and the water was running down you got the leaves all stuck to it here from our monster So, I, one reason I finally wanted to try doing this is because of the mess it's making in the misters. The misters, even with the filter on it, it will plug your coil. It didn't plug the coil yet, but actually, you know, it didn't. But one reason is probably because I have a brand new filter on it. So, this is my temporary thing I was messing with a valve that turned on and off the filter. As it had it turning on. It's 120 volt solenoid water valve there. It was the other bad thing I just realized it was doing it today, confirmed it was I came home and this thing wasn't actively heating the water or cooling the room and the mister was on. So I think that water valve I got off Amazon, but it might be because I had it just like spraying one mister. I think something to do with the pressure differential or whatever, when it when it turns off it doesn't I think the pressure being on the other side, maybe it doesn't get the valve action to close. So it's stuck a few times. I know if I went and powered it and then removed the power, the next time it would close. So I'm probably gonna save that valve and put it on my actual, my misters at my gazebo because with all those misters, the pressure will drop, you know. And I'll, I'll probably have it so we can put just a toggle, uh, little light switch out there and it turns on the pump, turns on the water. It'd be cool. So this is almost ready for me to, to do and I get to hurry up now because the sun's starting to go down. Yeah, might as well show how I do this, a little too late, but... So you have this crimp point here, right? Looks like that. People think that looks like shit. But actually, when you put this thing on there, crimp it and round it out a little bit, it comes out pretty good. It's got a scar on it, but that pipe is round. The phone's not focusing, but... All right, see if we can do this. You can see that's definitely flat, or, you know, from the pinch-off tool. I could use a daughter or somebody out here to help hold this thing. Once you get it started, it stays on on its own. So you kind of get it right over the center of it, and then you're just going to twist this. This is the old-school one. This is the first kind I would have before you even use these. Well, I guess it kind of always have both. Once it gets uh, going, then it's fine. And then you can even just maybe a little bit and kind of round it out. And this video's probably come out like shite, but we're in a hurry. I just want to show you guys. But, I mean, people will talk crap, you know, that it has a scar on it, but it's not pinched shut. And then I'm like, are you serious? Are you looking at all these crazy fittings in an AC system and some of them are a lot worse than this you know crazy angles turns and stuff I'm like the liquid and it's liquid here ain't gonna care you know that there's a scar on there it's it's the volume's not pinched down enough to uh, do anything now this one here you know you've got a lot better job on it than that one but it should be ready to rock equalizer at 280 280 which goes about 91 is that all it is outside right now i am surprised okay i uh disconnected the manifold set and put it away test of getting out this tried and true set and some of this stuff's been replaced some hasn't i think i, I just replaced these but look at these i mean you could tell somebody that's used this stuff like <laughs> one thing i'll have to admit though <laughs> is uh i kind of prefer these if i bought these new again i'd be tempted to rip this uh rubber off and, and just wrap it with tape again because i could push in there to turn it on but like this it would always turn itself on it was, it was nuts so, this one broke on me a while back when it fell that was kind of disappointing so we're gonna let this boot up 
One thing about this big tablet is the scaling. I could kind of, you could pitch to zoom on that, but all the fonts of like selecting refrigerants, right? Which I did 134A the other day. Is, uh, is freaking tiny. So 134A, God, I can hardly read that. I'm almost out to zoom with this. 410, where is it? Where are you? Close. I mean, and I am wearing bifocal contacts, so the focal distance is back here, but the, that the font is so small, so if I get close to it, my eyes don't see that, don't focus on it anymore. So everything's booting up. It was 101 in there, but I think it actually might be 90 something degrees out here, but believe it or not, I'll let that sit for a second while I get all my, uh, everything put back together. I gotta put my low loss fittings and everything back on here. It is becoming a mess back here. Just ignore that. That's where I throw my oil. So we empty the oil out. Everything right here is on the side where we pull the trailer through. But, uh, all right, we're about ready to fire it up. Got the uh, liquid line, suction, suction temp, liquid temp, outside air temp. And the other probe is inside in the high wall. So it should be still adjusting. So this one here with all the uh, relative humidity and everything is the outdoor one and this is the one in the room it is uh i think 91 or 92 in there so that's coming down as the i just stuck it in there because it was out here so i'm gonna go ahead probably not be able to do it one hand but i'm gonna plug this in and i'm sure i'm gonna have to add some refrigerant to it but we'll let it run just plugged it in like 94 and dropping still inside thermostatic says 91 or 92 so the space is about that so, so if this drops down to uh like 72 73 that would be a 20 degree split at this point and see the suction is dropping so it's not dropping like a rock up oh, actually kind of leveled off right there this is a capillary tube metering device, so it's actually just creeping back up. I know it's gonna need some refrigerant just because I just, I lost a little bit of refrigerant, not much though. And I just, you know, replaced this much coil with that much. So what is that liquid line temp? 110, so we're like 10 over amp in or so. And the suction one, 95. Remember the space temperature is, a, you know, close to that in there dropping down so I'll probably squeak a little bit of refrigerant in there I'm gonna let it keep running for a few minutes and I kind of need to get going so I can't really hold the camera <laughs> but I'm gonna add just a little bit a little bit a little bit and uh, see if we can correct this right now it's got two degrees sub cooling <laughs> in 69 super heat is dropping a little bit it's actually went up to 90 but this this of course pressure should be a lot higher given the load in there uh, I think the water heater was still 120-ish. It was like 124, 125 earlier. So it's probably between 120 and 124. So the water is actually at pretty much close to full temp. As it continues to get a little dark on me, but this is only like five minutes later. Um, added just a pinch of refrigerant. It's still not there, but I'm just gonna creep up on it. And you can see already the suction's like, you know, hover about 115, 116, 425 on the high side. Still got only two to three degrees sub cooling. Sub cooling is not really a thing for capillary tube metering devices, it's just, but it is an indicator, you know, excessive charge, obviously. Superheat slowly correcting. And it's already dropping into the 70s coming out the vent. So yeah, it's over 10 degree split already. Um, and just one thing I was just thinking a few minutes ago is like, you know, the title of the site I made years ago in like 2006 or 8 or whatever it was is hack free HVAC but you do see some hackery on here but the hackery is not professional grade <laughs> for you know for customers or anything it's it's experimental at home stuff like that so not to be confused this is hacking stuff you know as far as an experimenter screwing around stuff like that Boy, is this rotary compressor taking a lot of abuse for the last couple years. Man, 
You gotta think it's been heating my water for a couple years. So, anyway. Temperature. Still got a lot of super heat. So I just need to squeeze a little more refrigerant in there. I'll go ahead and do that let it run a few minutes as the sun continues to uh, mock me. Okay, I should be getting close to a couple more squirts of R410. Still got low, pretty low subcooling. Three degrees pretty much. Super heat's down to 30. We have 91 degrees in this space. I just added it a little bit so supply's still dropping so it's pretty much at a 20 degree split though. Um, 91 in there. We are 104 out here. 29%. So it's coming down. Looks good. Capillary tubes working great. Um, this is two runs in parallel. I mentioned before, but what all I do is I just use online calculators, and I just put the BTUs. So say this is like 10,000. I'll say all right, 5,000 per tube. Uh, two tubes. 5,000 BTUs. The diameter of the tube and the temperature you're running, I think it's like 50, right? Whatever, and uh, it gives you the uh, the length. And we're at like 51 degrees. You know, that'll drop a little bit as the pressure drops and as the temperature in the space drops. But we're already, it's already cooling good. It's already cooling better than it has been, I think. Because I haven't really been getting a 20 degree split anymore. Now with that undersized coil, uh, capillary tube doing what it's supposed to do. When everything is hot, you get a little uh, extra non-condensed you know you got some bubbles in with the liquid that slows down the capillary tube so it doesn't overfeed you know as the pressure goes up and then as it gets cooler outside and the pressures go down it also has more subcooled liquid so it flows through faster so it is a little bit of a balance but once you dial it in it kind of does modulate <laughs> actually you know it almost makes you want to go back to that sometimes <laughs> instead of like freaking TFCs. We had these Gettle package units, you can look them up. They were made by Gettle. Don't be confused by the company that bought it out now and puts Gettle logos on the piece of shit Goodman units. Rebadging them. But the original Gettle from like the 60s, 70s, 80s and into the 90s is their heyday in Phoenix. They didn't use TXVs, or at least hardly ever. They, uh, they, they were famous for just having a capillary tube like that between the indoor and outdoor coral on heat pumps. Two corals are about the same size. They didn't have the you know, the mismatch, like you do now, a lot of stuff with the higher efficiency, larger evaporator coils, you can't do that anymore, but on heat pumps, but they used to, and it used to just work for just 40 years, man. They would always put like high pressure cutouts, low pressure cutouts, big capacitors that were huge, man. And those units would just run forever. So I think I about got it. I don't know if I'll put another squirt in there or whatever, but. It is 91 in there and it's 68 supply. Super heat, see it's getting down less than 30. Burn. I think that rock sound is pretty normal. Super heat is dropping. Sometimes I gotta just make sure this is actually on there in a good spot too hot out here where that's at so that super heat's probably a little lower than it says is because the probe is not in fully insulated you know it's clamped on but could be influenced a little bit from the outside heat right here into my mechanical room slash later this is where I keep the inverter charger lithium-ion batteries by the way, I checked those not too long ago again. Dead nuts even. Oh, it is well nice and cool. There's a mechanical probe right here. So it's like, yeah, like 68, just like it says out there. And here's the temperature in here, 90. There's the Bluetooth probe, yeah. Here's the uh, circulating pump. Set point, this is the temperature in this tank. 125 degree, and the 50 gallon tank. So I get the right angle, that thing won't. Uh, that, it's at a 125. Kick ass. Oh yeah, just to see how many watts this thing pulls. 
It's right at a thousand. Let me turn off the light. This this is for everything in this room. Well, not everything, but a lot of the hardware in this room. So it's bouncing around 900 watts, a little under. That 900 watts is the compressor, the pump, which doesn't pull much, the outdoor fan, and this thing too if it's running, but I think, ooh, that's hot. So this, this thing's on. Anyway, I think I hear the wife about to interrupt me. So yeah, it's efficient. Unlike the 4,500 watt heating element that's in there. Food is here, so I need to finish this up. But pretty good. I might put one little tiny squirt of R410 in there. Other than that, I gotta finish the video. Looks like it was successful. We'll see how it goes. Now I won't have that mess of the mister. And hopefully it's still efficient at heating the water. That's the, that's the thing is I need to have good compression ratio. You know, get the temperature up there to, uh, Keep that water. I mean, you can't even put your, hold your hand on here. So this is probably about 160, maybe even higher. I do have a lot of heat blowing out of that. So this coil, and the way I have it sealed up, it's definitely rejecting heat. It's a, basically a wow, it really is. That's a secondary heat exchanger now. <laughs> the primary one's the tube and tube back there, to the circulating pump, to the tank, and then this one. I mean, it's this thing ought to be happy. And then, like I said, it's heating. Usually heat's pretty good, it's just that the room wasn't cooling very good. A little too much hot gas, wasn't feeding very well. Needed to reject just a little more heat. Might have been able to get away with hacking this thing right here, but I just said screw it. We'll see how it goes until the next time. It's just, this is just a continuous Frankenstein project. It, like I said, it's taking abuse and it just keeps on running, man. It's pretty cool. And, and like I said, I. When, when summer ends and I don't want to cool that room anymore, all I'll do is I've got to close off the liquid line here, I think it is. This goes around into the... No, it's this one. This one goes here to the cap tube. Close it down, pump it down, and then uh, this, then, then you just open this one to become the evaporator right here. It'll be it's pretty interesting because the evaporator freezes up a couple times a winter. We have mild winters here. But having a secondary heat exchanger here might, might keep that from... Might not uh, freeze up anymore. This might also kind of kill my efficiency for the for uh, heating the water in the winter. So we'll find out if this was a double-edged sword. On that time, might wind up separating it or insulating this part or something, or maybe it'll work just fine. So with that, I'll catch you guys later. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share all this nonsense, uh, experiments, and all that kind of stuff. And it's Frankenstein's lab here, so it's kind of a joke, but that. Catch you guys later. Sun's going down.